Hello everyone, this is Kessel Raptorial. So, I'm going to take a bit of a break tonight from reporting on the Kilauea and Fuego uh, volcanic eruptions. I am still following the stories. Um, I might get to, uh, to reading another article that I saw posted on MSN uh, early today. I have a lot of other work to do tonight. Uh, I have to wake up early to take part in a coding class tomorrow. Uh, that's being offered at my local library. I'm not in college anymore. Thank goodness. So for now, I'd like to read an article that I came across in the April 2018 issue of Smithsonian Magazine, Tall Tales. And it's an article that's really only two pages long. I will post the pictures included in the article uh, as I read the story. It talks about California's giant sequoias tell the story of our conflicted relationship with nature. This is an interesting little piece, so let's dive in. In the winter of 1852, while chasing a wounded grizzly bear in the mountains of eastern California, a hunter named Augustus T. Dowd encountered a very large tree. It had red-orange bark and clouds of sea-green needles, and it would have taken more than a dozen men with outstretched arms to encircle it. When Dowd told his campmates what he found, they laughed. Then he took them to see the tree. Newspapers trumpeted the discovery, calling the find, long known to Native Americans, the Sylvan Mastodon and the Vegetable Monster. Soon, another group of men returned to Dowd's tree and, perhaps inevitably, cut it down. Everybody counted the rings on the felled trunk differently. One reporter estimated it to be 2,500 years old, another 4,000, and a third 6,500. It must have been a little plant when Samson was slaying the Philistines, one wrote. In fact, the tree in question was only about 1,200 years old relatively young for one of the Earth's longest living and largest species. The astounding trees we now know as giant sequoias can live for more than 3,000 years and grow to some 300 feet. And the superlative species inspired this young growing nation like no other living thing. That it is rare and limited in its range, the tree lives in only about 70 groves in the middle elevations of the Sierra Nevada made it all the more fascinating. For more than 150 years, the noblest tree species in the world, as the great naturalist John Muir called it, has been a symbol of America's grandeur, our fraught relationship with nature, and our fears about the future. The nation had only recently seized California from Mexico when Dow made his discovery. And the ancient giants were the upstart nations answered to the old world's cathedrals. California, one 1853 article predicted, will yet be found not only to surpass the rest of the, of the world in the extent and abundance of her gold and the magnitude of her trees, but in her natural bridges, her mammoth caves, and her Niagara's. Big tree mania set in, William Tweed writes in a 2016 his, history of the giant sequoia. Pieces of Dowd's tree went on toward to San Francisco and to New York City. By 1855, a hotel had been built in the grove. Later, promoters cut a wide passage in the base of one giant and charged for carriage rides through it. The souvenirs proliferated. Candlesticks and canes turned from sequoia wood, packets of sequoia seeds, hotel postcards, and stereoscope images. A collection of giant sequoia memorabilia, recently acquired by Stanford University, serves as a snapshot of the country's obsession and impulse to cash in on it. Timberman, t Timberman toppled the giant sequoias, one by one, and then by the grove full. By the end of the 19th century, that's 1801 to year 1900, the American frontier was closed. The herds of buffalo, bison, and the great flocks of passenger pigeons were gone, and some feared the magnificent trees would disappear too. Nature could be used and used up but the idea of conservation had taken root. Two, 
Two of the first three national parks were created to protect the sequoias. Such rescue attempts had unintended consequences. Early conservationists suppressed fires, which they thought damaged the sequoias. In truth, the trees needed nature's regular, low-burning blazes to thin their competition and to clear ground for their seedlings. Decades of fire suppression left the groves packed with, groves packed with vegetation that could fuel bigger, more damaged fires like the one that like the one that swept into King's Canyon in 2015, killing approximately 10 large sequoias. Grove managers have worked to return the habitat to a more natural state since the 1960s, but say many sequoia groves remain overgrown and at risk. Our fascination with these giants hasn't diminished since the days of the big tree mania. In 2014, more than a million people visited the Mariposa Grove in Yosemite National Park home to approximately 500 giant sequoias. Vehicles and parking lots and concrete paths were encroached, encroaching on the tree's habitat. The grove was closed in 2015 for restoration. It will reopen this spring. But there is a problem more insidious than sneaker-clad tourists. Climate change. Oh boy, here we go. In 2015, after two years of drought, many sequoias began losing their needles. Nobody alive had ever seen this before. It seems like another sign of the times, a losing struggle to save even the rarest and best of things. In 50 years, the whole population could be in trouble, one researcher told the New York Times. Yeah, because the New York Times is so reliable. When the snows and rains came in 2017 and ended the drought, the sequoias were still standing. The trees, it now seems, had shed their needles as a way to reduce their need for water. Last summer, the needles began to grow back, and with them are hopes for the sequoias. But with temperatures rising and weather patterns changing, their future is uncertain to, as uncertain as it was in Muro's day. God has cared for these trees, saved them from drought, disease, avalanches, and a thousand storms, he wrote in the early 1900s. But he cannot save them from the sawmills and fools. This is left to the American people. Now, I tried to keep my smart mouth commenting to a minimum while reading the article. I can never keep it to zero. Yesterday I was talking with the invertebrate paleontologist I work under at the uh, museum about numerous tensions that we went on in our discussion that day. We tend to do that while working. We started talking about the view volcanoes erupting in Hawaii and Guatemala. Yeah, I guess there's no getting away from that. And it led to talking about volcanoes in, uh, in the solar system, uh, other worlds, about uh, Io and Europa, moons of Jupiter, and Enceladus, uh, moon of Saturn. These are not volcanoes created from tectonic activity, but by gravitational squeezing of the moons by the giant planets, melting their interiors. And I humorously referred to Io and Europa as Jupiter's squeeze toys, stress balls. Which might be completely true, but let's not dwell for too long on that. Okay, so I just went through the Smithsonian article titled Tall Tales. So let's have a short discussion about it. The first three paragraphs tell a very nice story. The fourth tells this narrative we've heard over and over again, annoyingly, that the United States stole the Southwest states from Mexico. This is ridiculous. First of all, the Spanish, when they came to the New World, devastated Mexico. There were vicious wars against the native civilizations there. And let's not forget that these civilizations, the Inca, the Maya, the Aztec, and others, at this time were not pacifists either. They were constantly at war with neighboring tribes, constantly taking slaves and sacrificing them to their gods, except Quetzalcoatl, who was the one deity in Mesoamerican mythology who actually opposed human sacrifice, and to ensure some vague conception of the balance of the universe, turns out it did not save them. Mexico itself was created through conquest many times over, uh, long before the ancestors of the Americans today uh, came to the American Southwest. All the chaos that spun out of the wars that were going on for hundreds of years, thousands of years probably. Um, and by the way, Nobody crossing the Mexican-American border, which needs a wall, is trying to immigrate 
south. So it's time to drop the idea that America owes Mexico any land or reparation at all. Now, there was a lot of logging that took place in the 18th and 19th centuries. One, the first three paragraphs tell a very nice story. The fourth tells this narrative we've heard over and over again, annoyingly, that the United States stole the Southwest states from Mexico. Stole the Southwest states from Mexico. This is ridiculous. First of all, the Spanish, when they came to the New World, devastated Mexico. There were vicious wars against the native civilizations there. And let's not forget that these civilizations, the Inca, the Maya, the Aztec, and others, at this time were not pacifists either. They were constantly at war with neighboring tribes, constantly taking slaves and sacrificing them, sacrificing them to their gods, except Quetzalcoatl, who was the one deity in Mesoamerican mythology who actually opposed human sacrifice and to ensure and to ensure some vague conception of the balance of the universe turns out it did not save them Mexico itself was created through conquest many times over uh, long before the ancestors of the Americans today uh, came to the American Southwest all the chaos that spun out of the wars that were going on for hundreds of years, thousands of years probably. Um, and by the way, nobody crossing the Mexican-American border, which needs a wall, is trying to immigrate south. So it's time to drop the idea that America owes Mexico any land or reparation at all. Now, there was a lot of logging that took place in the 18th and 19th centuries. One of the great things about the North American ecosystem is that, as mostly temperate forest, um, has some wet regions, some dry regions, a lot of it is temper temperate forest in the, um, in the Great Plains is grassland, uh, the Pacific Northwest is uh, actually temperate rainforest. North America has soil that can regrow forests even after they've been cleared. This is because you have a lot of gradual buildup of a fertile soil layer that, as long as it's not completely removed, will remain after the trees are cut and can feed nutrients to new generations of entire forests um, if it is not pushed too far. Not the case with tropical forests, with tropical uh, rainforests in particular. If you clear tropical rainforest, that soil is now, within a couple years, will be completely unusable for the, foreseeable, for the foreseeable future. The question is, why? Well, tropical rainforests have a lot of vegetation, a lot more, um, what's, biomass. A lot more biomass, both vertically and horizontally than temperate forests. And what happens is that any fertile soil layer rich in decaying plant and animal mat, any fertile soil layer rich in decaying plant and animal material that does build up, any nutrients gets reabsorbed by the living plants and animals pretty much immediately. So the soil builds up only the very thinnest of nutrient-rich layers of any type of forest. And when people come into a tropical forest and cut down the trees so they can set up their farms, guess how long that farm is sustainable? A year? Maybe two? Then it's useless, effectively forever. Because humans don't have hundreds of thousands of years to wait for the soil to build up enough that new forests can grow. Temperate forest soil, which has less plant and animal matter to feed, and where decomposition takes place at a slower rate, is more sustainable. It too can be pushed too far. When people realized that the world's resources are not infinite, uh, on, on, on a large scale, on a, uh, this, had, this had been known by some peoples before, but we're talking in the close to modern century times. 
Uh, and when they really began on this scale to appreciate leaving some natural areas unspoiled, the concept and then efforts of conservation actually took root pretty quickly. And luckily, North America could still regrow its forests. A lot of that is thanks to the fact that it is a temperate region. And to people waking up to the needs of conservation when they did, one of my main concerns now is that natural science is becoming engulfed by and directed by politics and popular social narrative without taking into consideration the real long-term consequences. Very bad. If you care about conservation, you need to turn conservative. And as is pointed out in the article, even once conservation efforts have begun, they had a lot to learn. It turned out that the suppression of forest fires was only fueling bigger fires in the future, and so they had to let a small scale brush fires play out so that not only could the plants that competed with the sequoia saplings be removed, because huge trees take a very long time to grow and they are completely vulnerable to being crowded out and outcompeted by faster growing plants when they are very young. But also because larger forest fires would just destroy the entire forest, and uh, they don't want that. So there were lessons to learn, and there were revisions to the efforts to be done, but it did take root. Now, now, the climate change issue is extraordinarily complex. I'm still trying to relearn a lot of that from the ground up because everything I got from school and especially college was completely one-sided and defiled by politics that had no idea how extraordinarily complex the Earth's climate really is. And we think we're going to be able to handle Mars. Uh, do not study climate science in college. You will be misled in every way. Because no one understands it well enough to reach a conclusion yet on what to do or exactly what is going on. If you are concerned with deforestation, and that part is fair, go and plant more trees in your yard, in your neighborhood, in your city. Go plant gardens for pollinators. Go plant fruit trees and vegetable gardens. Those are good steps to take right now. So, the bottom of the two pages is a little field guide to several different types of trees that are recovering their health and numbers in North America. We do have a problem right now with the invasive emerald ash borer beetle destroying our ash trees. I will put together a video presentation on that sometime. Um, many trees are recovering and we want more trees. Reforestation will actually help combat climate change, global warming, I mean, you know they really mean warming when they talk about climate change. If you're concerned about that, because plants remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, basic photosynthesis, and only remove trees when you absolutely have to. You know, one thing I'll say about native temperate forest dwellers like myself is that we really like our forests. A lot of wild growing patches don't give us enough fruit that we bother with harvesting them. Uh, we have fruit tree farms specifically grown and cultivated for that. So the wild woods we like to leave as they are. As this article told the story of, it was different only a couple hundred years ago. Now that many of our forests have regrown, we want to keep them now. So when people from the plains or more arid regions come to live here and cut down some of the trees, it's, uh, you know, it, it's not something we make a huge deal about as long as they don't cut down very many, but it still is a little irritating. Uh, so on that note, it is both very late at night as I'm finishing this, and we've covered a lot of the major talking points of this article, anyway, it's, uh, it's only two pages long. You can try to get a copy if you want. Uh, ask your local library if they have a way to pull the article from the Smithsonian Archives. 
The citation of the original article is this. Uh, Tall Tales, California's Giant Sequoia, tell the story of our conflicted relationship with nature. Smithsonian Magazine, April 2018, pages 7 to 9, written by Zachary St. George. I hope you all enjoyed the little opening of me and my kitty Blackberry. He's a sweet kitty. And yes, he's still with me. That cameo of him was put together from a clip I recorded only a few days ago. So, till next time, this is Kestoraptorial, the Velociraptor fanboy and ecology enthusiast. I'll see you all soon.